Welcome to the CMT Summer Sessions. We are breaking the mold from our regular format this summer and sharing with you some content that we believe will really be essential for your ministry. Uh, this time, we're going to hear from my co-host and buddy, Paul Wooster, on what their ministry there at Chico State does to reach freshmen each year. I don't know anyone who puts in more planning and prayer and effort into reaching freshmen than Paul and his team there. And so I love the title of this one, Give Me Freshmen or Give Me Death. So what was your thinking behind this title, Paul? <laughs> well, basically, I believe that freshmen are the future of our ministries. The freshmen that you reach each year will influence your ministry for at least the next five years. So this year, also due to COVID, it's almost like we have two freshman classes to reach. My friend Brian Zuniga is calling it them freshmores. <laughs> Let's get after it this fall. What do you say? And make sure to check out all the resources that Paul mentions at campusministry.org. All right, let's get this party started, y'all. We're here to talk about the one of the most important things about collegiate ministry. Um, actually, one thing that um, we were actually, I was hanging out with Robbie Gallaty this morning, and uh, he was talking about this revival that just happened, and um, it was amazing. It was an amazing time. But one of the things he talked about before this revival that took place in December, about five months up leading up to it, he listed off a litany of spiritual warfare things that happened in his life. His things were breaking down in his house. He had like he listed off like twenty different doctor or dental trips that he had to take just himself personally um, before he. Um, before he's and then before he saw, started seeing that revival and so I think actually I and even just me I've, I've been getting ready for this workshop I, I really feel like as, as I was writing this material um, even just kind of leading up to I was praying some extra time like I feel there's just this weight of what God wants to do in your ministries this fall and every fall our ministry um, sees all sorts of spiritual warfare. Like half the people get sick, <laughs> um, staff infections, um, drama in the ministry. And when you're advancing against the gates of hell, don't be surprised when all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. And so if you are advancing the kingdom of God, Satan is going to be worried. And so I just want us all to take a moment, um, just a moment of silence, like a minute, and just in your own heart, um, ask God to quiet your heart, confess any sin, and um, just ask him to speak to you during this time and to, to not let any distractions um, take place. So let's just take one minute of, of silence and just pray. Pray for yourself. Pray, like, let's get real with God, and, um, and let's, let's do that. God, um, I'm trusting you to work during this time. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and uh, I ask that we would all unite around the vision and the purpose of rescuing souls for your kingdom, that we would see freshman ministry as nothing less than a life or death rescue mission. So, Lord, break our hearts fresh. Lord, help us to see the urgent realities and uh, not to shy away. Um, Lord, give us faith. Give us courage. Um, Use us, Lord. Use me as your servant right now, and uh, use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My name is Paul. I'm the National Collegiate Evangelism Director. This, the title of this workshop is "Give Me Freshmen or Give Me Death." <laughs> okay, um, and so let's connect. My email. This is my email here. I'd love to get emails and connect with you guys and personally serve you, um, help you, um, however I can. Um, and then uh, this is something I, I've just I've learned is. The average college campus in North America is 5% reached. Man, just let the weight of that sink in. Yeah. Uh, the Bay Area, the most unchurched city in North America, is 40% churched. Think about that, the comparison. Is there's, I know, I have a friend that's a mega church past, pastor at San Jose State. I mean, not San Jose, San Jose State, at San Jose, in San Jose. And they have thousands of people, they see tons of baptisms. All the while, San Jose State is sitting there with maybe 100 Christians involved out of 20,000 um, on the campus. 
And you can just all across the nation, it doesn't matter if you're in the buckle of the Bible Belt, the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. This workshop is not about recruiting already interested Christian freshmen. I think there's enough tools and resources that you, you I, I'm all for that. We need to keep our freshmen that we are, the, the students we already have. Don't hear me wrong. But man, my burden, my heart is to, to see those without Christ. This is the best time in someone's life to catch them because people tend to come to Christ in trouble and transition. Two times a 10 people tend to come to Christ and this is the biggest transition in a person's life. And a lot of times they have a lot of perceived trouble. They're insecure. <laughs> they wonder if that girl or guy likes them. Um, you know. And so this is a perfect time that God has chosen. So it's impossible to exaggerate the urgency of this mission. Um, because literally heaven and hell is hanging in the balance. And I pray that we would have no chill, okay, when it comes to reaching freshmen each fall semester. We would, people would question our wisdom on how much effort, how much money, how much time that we spend reaching those without Christ. Spurgeon said this. He said, if there existed one man or woman who did not love the Savior, and if that person lived among the wilds of Siberia, and if it were necessary that all the millions of believers on the face of the earth should journey there, <laughs> and every one of them pleaded with him to come to Jesus before he could be converted, it would be well worth all the zeal, labor, and expense. If we had to preach to thousands year after year and never rescue but one soul, that one soul would be full reward for all the labor. For a soul is worth a countless price. So... This is something that we've seen in our ministry is that our motto is we do whatever it takes to reach lost students. And we mean that. Our, our ministry, that's, that's our first tagline. Our, our vision in three words is salvation. We do whatever it takes to reach lost students. Transformation. We labor to see students' lives changed by Jesus from the inside out. And multiplication. We make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And that's our vision. And the first thing is, is the fall. It's the best time in the world to reach people. And a passage that came to my mind as I was preparing, John 4, um, you know, Jesus is hanging out and the, his disciples went out to get food, to get some, some, uh, some in and out some Chick-fil-A. Um, they came back and um, they said, Rabbi, eat something. He says, I have food to eat that you do not know anything about. So the di disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there yet four months and then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Um, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you do not labor. Others have labored and you have entered it into their labor. I don't think the problem is that there aren't that as many interested, open freshmen. I think the problem is we're not seeing our campuses with eyes of faith. I think the problem is not with the harvest. The harvest is plentiful. The problem is a lack of labors. There's a lack of people that are willing to roll up their sleeves and, and grind and hustle and do the work of a labor and share the gospel. John 9, 4, Jesus said this, he said, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Can work. We found that there's a direct connection to how many people we share the gospel with and how many people we lead to Christ. <laughs> okay? It starts with, uh, uh, just, it starts where you are. So I want to encourage you. I'm going to be sharing some numbers and some exciting stuff that God's done. But it started with just my wife and I. And we started with the lamest event in the history of college ministry, okay? <laughs> uh, I told this at the last uh, workshop I did, but basically we, we had free pizza. You know, we bu they bought their own pizza, <laughs> okay? Uh, and we had awkward conversation from, for 30 minutes, and they left, never saw them again. Two graduate students came. But from there, God blessed it, and uh, um, we had it, the next event, we barely had enough to get a, a game of three-on-three -three volleyball together, our cool, really cool barbecue, you know? Um, and by the end of that first week, we did events every night for those first two weeks, my wife and I, and um, by the end of those first two weeks, we had 12 show up to our first evangelistic Bible study. And then um, Christy and I uh, sat, 
sat down with each one of those 12, and right from the start, six of those people trusted Christ. We started plugging them in, started discipling. By the end of the year, we, we had 12 people that were in one-on-one discipleships. I was, I was discipling about six, and Christy was about discipling about six. And the next year, we, we, we grew a little bit incrementally. And about year four or five, we started to raise up laborers. Our goal is to help a student go from loss to labor in one year. And so by then, by year four or five, we had about 15, 20 laborers. And uh, then the, the flywheel kicked in. The momentum kicked in. And um, fast forward 12 years later, we've seen about 1,000 people make professions of faith in Christ. In the last school year, we had over 200 people. Almost every single day, I got a text message from a student leader about a con- gospel conversation they were, they were having on the, on the campus and someone that was trusting Christ. So we, I just think, I want to encourage you. And actually, um, the reality is there's nothing special about me or what I've done. Um, it's just I, I've taken, I've stolen things from other people, and it's, I've been anxious, insecure, discouraged, almost through the entire process. There's been a battle, a spiritual battle, personally. And my wife has a bad back about um, nine years ago um, when, she, when we had my um, son. Her hips went out of, bat, out of joint, and she's been stuck in her chair um, 24-7 pretty much. She can get up for about 20 minutes at a time. Um, and God, God used that. I was like the advanced sanctification program <laughs> for me. He knew I needed a lot of work, and he whipped me into shape, um, and uh, I still have a lot of work to, to go. But, um, but it was super humbling and painful and hard and difficult, and we've had all sorts of spiritual warfare. The second year, we almost completely blew up the entire ministry with a staff conflict. Um, and so I, I just want to say, as we move into the more of the nuts and bolts, man, this won't, this won't cost you much. It'll just cost your entire life, <laughs> okay? It won't cost you much. It'll just cost your entire life. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost you if you take reaching the lost and making disciples seriously. But the truth is, freshmen are the future of your ministry. Um, Jim Sylvester, in a great book, I recommend Principle God, God Honors, says, when we lose a freshman class, we pay for it for five years. So the truth is, freshmen are the most open people to getting plugged into your ministry, People come to Christ in trouble and transition. I want you to take a minute and discuss, do you remember how you felt as a freshman? Who reached out to befriend you and what churches or ministries tried to reach out to you? So we're just going to take like three minutes and discuss that. And it'll give me a chance to compose myself a little bit. So that's fine. <laughs> so, man, keep that in mind. And now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty, okay? We're going to do this. Um, the friends a student makes the first three weeks determines the course of their entire life. I firmly believe this. Um, For most freshmen, it determines the course of their entire life. Um, And the average student is looking for two things. Let's let's live in reality. They're looking for friends, and they're looking for fun. They want to be where the party's at with cool people like them. Okay? That's that's what they want to do. And so they are shallow, but it's not shallow to meet them where they are. It's actually missional. It's contextualized to the campus culture. Um, so our bottom line goal is um, to get as many interested contacts as possible. So our goal, the last time, uh, the first year, we went out, and I'm going to give you the first year's numbers, and that because that might be more realistic for some of you guys that are starting out. Um, our goal, we didn't have a goal, but we tabled for, from Monday through Friday for 10 days. I mean, from 10 to 2, 10 to 2 in the, in the union, my wife and I and two high school seniors, they were homeschooled, <laughs> tabled, um, and we did it from 10 to 2, and we, got, we talked to 600 students, which we were really happy about, and 200 of those 600 checked the box saying, I'm interested in hearing more about Christian talent. And I've seen that to be the case. About one in three students that we've talked to on our campus have expressed interest in our group. Um, because we, we, so I can explain more about that. Um, basically, you want to do everything you can before they get to campus. So we do a lot of stuff on Instagram, uh, finding freshman groups, and DMing. Uh, we've DMed all the freshmen in the freshman group, student to student do that. We have a whole article about how to do that. We actually started doing that more because of COVID. So I can send you an article where one of our social media, we have a girl that's like a guru at social media. She ran a whole nerdy system on how to make sure every freshman that was anywhere on social media 
got a DM from one of our student leaders before they even stepped on the campus. And we, we ended up seeing a ton of gospel appointments and about 20 salvations over Zoom before um, this, it, during COVID, before even campus started. <laughs> so it's amazing. You can do a lot before, but once the students, the day the students move in, we have our team. Um, right now it's about 50, and they're all there on campus with T-shirts. And usually it ends up being about 20 at a time because people have, have work and other things. And uh, we send them out to two by two to do 30 second surveys. And so we go up to everyone on campus. And uh, this is our, our, so this is the free tool, 30 second surveys. You can find it at campusministry.org. But this is our, our script. We walk up to people and we say, hey, um, we're, we're talking with everyone on campus about this 30 second survey. And we're a group, with a group called Christian Challenge. You've got a few moments to help us out. It also enters you to win an AirPod um, Pro giveaway. Uh, you've got a moment to help us out? They're like, yeah, sure, why not? And you just hand it to them. And that first week, everyone says yes to everything. <laughs> okay? So that's uh, just a very narrow window. Uh, you notice the second week, the third week, people start just ignoring everything. They, like, walk through, like, the gauntlet, you know, just like. Um, but that first week and a half, two weeks is a prime time. So we talk to, uh, our goal is to get 2,000 interested contacts, 2,000 people that check the box. And so we ended up talking to about 6,000 people out of our 16 um, 16,000 students at Chico State and almost every freshman we got to talk to and and so this is what we say we hand them the flyer there's a flyer a really cool flyer with all of our fun events and then a survey that they fill out themselves say awesome all you got to do is fill it out it takes about 30 seconds a minute and uh, it'll enter you to win the raffle thanks for helping us out and they start filling it out and then we just say we say um, how's it going you know where are you from what dorm are you in make some small talk and then say have you heard about Christian Challenge and then, um, with every, and that's, oh, that's how we get it. Um, and then this is the, um, we give them a little script. Have you heard about Christian Challenge? And most of them say no, or they say, yeah, I got a DM from someone. And in either way, you're like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> we're a Christian group on campus that does all sorts of fun events, large group meetings, Bible studies. Tonight at 9 p.m., we're meeting up to play this crazy capture the flag style game across campus called The Walking Dead. If you check the box at the bottom, one of our student leaders will send you a text invite in, in, uh, tonight and for upcoming events. And so we, they get a personal text from an actual real life human uh, <laughs> um, that day. That's a couple hours after when we, we go home, we scurry back. We actually, the entire time, we have a pretty cool table. I wish I had a picture of it, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty decent table. Um, and so we have about six to eight people at the table. We have music. We have free food, we give away drinks and sodas, and we have an a arcade-style basketball hoop. Um, we try to make that table just a bro magnet. We want, we want them to come. <laughs> and then we do a, a, an AirPod or iPad giveaway. So anything we can do to draw people to the table. And we do the same script at the table. But the 30-second surveys is a game changer because it's you take the table to the campus. And so at any given time, we'll have about 20, 30 people swarming the campus um, it's hard to make it across campus without talking to one of our teams. And it's been amazing. People feel so welcomed. And people are really open. The college campus is a recruitment culture. Every club worth its salt is recruiting. And, and so we can capitalize. It's the best place in the world to do evangelism besides maybe prison. Okay, <laughs> it, it, It's one of the best places to do evangelism. It's all hands on deck. So during the first part of the fall, Everyone is on freshman leadership team, okay? Everyone is. Um, we've even brought in mission teams of young adults from churches in our area to put on t-shirts if they look enough like a college student, um, to put on our challenge t-shirt, and we, we let them swarm. And so we've had, that's helped um, create more, more contacts and more momentum when we didn't have as big of a leadership team. So you might want to pray about even, we've had mission teams from other campuses. If you have a stagger, if one campus starts a week before another one, maybe send a, a blitz, you know, a squad to come just blitz the campus for a couple days and get warmed up for their own fall outreach, get students. Um, so that, that's been a really awesome. Um, actually, we've seen a lot of people that went on those mission trips um, called into vocational ministry, campus ministry, as a result of getting that exposure. We've, I mean, actually, it's almost like we've done, God's done more in the people that came on those mission trips and what he did through them. But it, it's, it's been amazing. <laughs> One time we had our drummer, the day of 
um, our large group meeting, our drummer ghosted us. <laughs> okay, so we had a band, and it was like a big large group meeting, big production that we were trying to put on. And our drummer ghosted us, and it happened to be one of the mission team guys could play drums, and so we just threw him on the drums. And so that, that's been really helpful. Um, so we've even done things like puppies and popsicles at the table. So we, had, we got like all of our friends, we had the English Bulldog, we had all sorts of like the cutest puppies you could get just swarming the table, and we were giving away popsicles. Um, anything short of sin to, 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 to meet people, okay? And we would, we would grind, we would hustle. From Monday, um, from the day students move in to um, the end of week two of class. So we did about 14 days straight from, from 10 to 2 um, on campus meeting people. And people were, you know, kind of tired of us by then. But we were able to reach, our goal was 2,000 contacts. We got that one year. One year, we got 2,000 people check the box saying, I'm interested in hearing more about Christian Challenge. And usually, we get about 1,800 to 1,600, um, something like that. And they get a text. Uh, so this is a, a, a statement I want to emphasize is, don't under, underestimate the pace of life of a student the first month on campus. We've had people come to our meetings and uh, come to our barbecue the first day they move in. and. We talked to them a week later. They didn't even know they were there. <laughs> there's like this fog over their eyes. They, they, there's so much life that happens in that first month. Yeah. It's insane. And so it's Im almost impossible to over do overkill, to do too much to reach people, because there's so much that happens. And so once you have a contact, that is a precious commodity. I am, people call me the contact Nazi, OK? <laughs> like, I make sure, I tell the people, our students that are texting, do not let this person fall through the cracks. Don't forget to not text this person. This is a soul, OK? And so they text them, give them a personal text the same day, inviting them to a social event that night. And, uh, and so that's, that's huge. Here's a note on texting. Don't give up on people too soon. Don't be spammy. But also, the other extreme is giving up on people too soon. Um, so you just have to, your own ministry and context, you have to figure, figure that one out. But we tend to be, encourage people to be personal and persistent. So even ask them, texting them, how's, it, how's the first day of school going? And not just all invites. Um, you can also be personal. Say, hey, how's it going? Anything I can help you find? Can you find, you want to find your classes? So more of a personal touch than a just business that's kind of trying to get them plugged in. So personal is most powerful. And then, um, we do a lot of what we call blind date gospel appointments, <laughs> okay? So we'll be texting someone, and if they text us back saying, oh, man, I can't come to the Walking Dead Capture the Flag event, but I'm interested in what you guys have going on, I'll text them back, and I'll say, hey, that's okay. I'd love to grab lunch or coffee with you sometime and tell you more about what Christian Challenge is all about and how you can get plugged in. You know, you got a time that can work for you? Got any time tomorrow or the next day? And we get a ton, and I'll be the guy wearing the Challenge T-shirt, you know, something like that, and meet in the union. And we've seen a lot of people get plugged in, and we've actually seen a lot of people get saved on the spot. We, and so you don't always have to share the gospel at that first encounter, but sometimes God really provides that opportunity. But the goal is just welcoming <coughs> people in. And so if they had that gospel appointment, then they're a lot, they already have two friends, because a lot of times if I do a gospel, our top-level leaders, if they do a gospel appointment, they, we practice the never share alone principle. So they always bring, I always bring a student with me, um, and they help make small talk, they help actually befriend, and I'm modeling evangelism to that person. And that's actually been more natural than one-on-one. Because we're just trying to welcome people in. It's not, we're not trying to do high pressure sales, okay? It's low pressure, it's relational, it's chill, it's, and, and God uses it. God uses that intentionality. And then don't underestimate the power of social events. Party with a purpose. Plan a social event for almost every day for the first two weeks. And I count social events, I count our large group meeting as one of those events, and our life group launch parties as those events, to so get them into the life groups, community groups. But students want to party, they want to make friends. Um, our ministry, we do 17 events in the first 18 days. Okay? So we do every night, or even some during the day, we do barbecues. And um, if fraternities can rush, why can't we? <laughs> Fraternities put Christian ministries to shame in their intentionality and getting people in. That's, I, that's enough said right there. Um, 
So, and then here's some advice. Make your first weekly meeting your biggest event of the year. So your first weekly meeting can draw a great crowd, even non-Christians that are curious. That's a great way to find out who's curious about, about um, don't be, you don't, so doing social events and being a Christian group are not at odds with one another. Have, being fun and being uh, bold about your faith are not at odds with one another. And so we do a ton of fun events, but we also, man, that first weekly meeting of the year, I preach the gospel loud and clear, and usually we see 10 to 20 people get saved that night. And so it's a gospel proclamation moment. And Because God just, I believe that evangelism is rigged, okay? I believe that, that God is sovereignly working. No matter what you believe about, this is still true whether you're a Calvinist or not or whatever, okay? That God is sovereignly drawing people to himself all over your campus. He is moving. And uh, one time in early years, I was struggling with discouragement driving to campus, and um, I was like, why? Man, this doesn't sound strategic. This is a waste of my time. And a, a verse of scripture that I memorized popped in my mind. It was Jesus showed up to the Apostle Paul in a dream, and he said, Jesus said, for I am with you. No one is going to attack or harm you, for I have many people in this city. And it was in that moment, God was just whispering to me, I have many people on that campus. I have many people that I want to save, that I'm working in, that I'm drawing. And so there's nothing random about the people you're doing 30-second surveys with. There's nothing random about the people that are coming by the, the table. There's nothing random about the people at your social events that are at your first weekly meeting. There's nothing random about random evangelism because God is sovereign, and God loves people far more than we ever will. And uh, the sovereignty of God is one of the, the greatest motivators for me personally in evangelism. Um, and that, that is, can be true no matter what your theological bent is, okay? Um, so I want to just encourage you. What if we looked at, looked at our campuses with eyes of faith? What if your student leaders could look into your eyes and see that you really believe that God is going to save people through you and your team this fall? When you get them together for the fall, um, for your core team retreat or whatever it is, they need to see that you believe the Spirit is active and He's willing to move. So here's here's some other advice. Um, plan a mix of cheap, low-maintenance events as well as bigger events that cost more money. This has been a game-changer for us because we do a lot of events, really creative events. We do one called Sports. <laughs> uh, Jonathan showed me this song. It's like it's what what band is it? Yeah, they say it's called Sports. You know, it's funny. Um, so we we do it on the lawn right next to the dorms, and we set up uh, a flag football thing. We set up a volleyball. We set up spike ball. We, we don't give away free food. Very, sometimes we do, but often it's just water and blankets. And we invite. We text everyone. Hey, a bunch of people are playing sports bunch of people from Challenge, even the less um, actually formal you can make it sound, the better. Hey, a bunch of people from my group Challenge are going to be going out and playing sports, football, volleyball, spike ball, and just chilling right next to the dorm at the field, right next to the dorm. You want to come hang out? And because students are looking for, they're not looking for an epic event, they're looking for friends. And so that, I think that's huge. And so do more, not less. And not every event has to, you have to drop several grand on it. Some events you can just buy water and ice and show up and play some football and get some numbers. And then don't compete with campus events, but work around them. So a lot of ministries, I, they make excuses. They think, well, the Welcome Week plan, the campus already, so we're going to partner with the Welcome Week. We don't want to compete with Welcome Week. And I, I agree. I don't want to, like, if the campus is planning an ice cream social, we're not going to plan an event at the same time as ice cream social. What we are going to do is send all of our students to the ice cream social to get numbers and to invite people to the Capture the Flag event that happens at 930 right after the ice cream social. And, or, or the house party that we're doing after the ice cream social at 10. Um, and so think, or, or we're doing barbecues during the day or um, sports events during the daytime hours. Um, so work. A, I don't think there's any reason not to do an event every single day once a student, or just some sort of social. It doesn't have to be even a formal thing with your banners and all that stuff. There has to be some way for your 
new students, the freshmen, to hang out with your upperclassmen or your, your student leaders every single day, at least for the, for the first, start the day the students move into the dorms till the first week of school, till that Sunday. That is like, there's no excuse, in my opinion. And, and so there's some grace there, of course, but um, here's some, some, some more thoughts. Time is not your friend. It's, everything slows down after the first two weeks. Everything slows down. The mission is so urgent. Uh, Peter Drucker has an uh, entrepreneurial strategy called the fastest and the mostest strategy. Okay? And there's all sorts of, and it just means you do the most and you do it first. You get there first. Man, it is a race. The fraternities will recruit. They are there helping, they're helping more, they're helping students move into the dorms, they're getting numbers. They're, you can bet that they're, in, they're texting these freshmen to invite them to that house party that night. You can bet, and, and it, it's really the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of Satan. This, it's, it's, there's the only turf war that matters is, is not you and crew or you and Chi Alpha. Or the only turf war that matters is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And so time is, is it not your friend during this time. Um, so um, here's some other advice. Don't get overly impressed with large crowds or overly depressed with small ones, <laughs> okay? So the point is not to have cool events that you can post on Instagram or send to your newsletter, <laughs> you know, put on your newsletter. The point is making students have friendships. And then remember also, perfectionism is not your friend. I'd rather be sloppy and scrappy and do a lot of stuff and do it um, I, I believe in excellence, but I think excellence can be an idol. I think, I think sometimes good enough is good enough, and students don't care. Okay? <laughs> students don't really care. The students don't care how many people are there. Okay? The only people that care exact, or that are counting the numbers are the staff in the back. They have to report. <laughs> you know? uh, the students are just, they wanna, they wanna, they're worried about themselves, and are these people going to accept me, and are these people going to love me? And so let's, let's stay focused on that. Um, focus more on making an impact than making an impression. And um, I'd say make sure your events are geared towards non-Christians, not Christians. Um, this sounds obvious, but I, I don't see it. A lot of times I see a lot of things that, man, that, that seems like that's more geared towards Christians. So more food, more fun, more hype um, on campus. Low bar of entry. Try and think like a freshman. And then this is, this is kind of a controversy a little bit, but get the bros. Okay? <laughs> I, want, I want to focus on what could be freshman guy friendly. Because the average BCM across the nation, average college ministry across the nation is 75% female. Okay? Because a lot of it appeals, what we do appeals to females. And um, so what we do, we do sports, dodgeball, we, do, we used to do this cliff diving thing. We went out, it's called the Flumes. We brought like 150 people up to this cliff diving spot. And uh, before it was, now it's illegal, so we don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, the freshman guys loved it. They're like, yeah, we're risking. My wife hated that event because she was like praying that no one would die every time. <laughs> um, we do capture the flag across campus, all across. It's crazy. We get like 200, 300 students just do this massive game across the whole campus. Um, food, bubble soccer, you get the idea. Just think about, if I was a freshman guy, what would I want to do? And, and make that. And then, um, this is even almost more important than your official events. Um, challenge students to hold unofficial after parties and hangouts. Students aren't looking for a friendly group, they're looking for friends. And so, yeah, this is, this is key. To, we give a vision, we have a, guys, a challenge guy's house and a challenge girl's house. And those become like kind of the place where people go and hang out and they do all sorts of crazy stuff, late night stuff. And, um, and when I was in the dorms I, at University of Oklahoma, we, the BCM, uh, had events, awesome big events. But I, my brother and I, my twin brother, we lived in the, in the dorms and uh, we did ice blocking. We would, we would get blocks of ice and go to the overpass by the freeway and we got like 50 people from our hall to go on, just sled down blocks of ice on the, on the grass. <laughs> you know, we did um, fountain jumping. We went and made a goal to jump in all the fountains on campus. Okay, minorly illegal. But we, we still, we did, we did all sorts of stuff 
and and our goal by that we were our goal was to be the first people to to meet. We knocked on every door the first day that the students moved into the dorms. So we were upper class and we lived in the fifth floor of Walker. And my brother and I went to every door. Hey, I'm Paul. This is David. Hey, you know, and welcome them. And tonight we're gonna go. Um, just the people in our hall. We're gonna go to the cafeteria. And we're gonna, all gonna eat together. And like, oh, sorry, I gotta go to Walmart with my mom. Oh, that's okay, Marion. Can I get your number? And I'll text you and I'll invite you to next time. Tomorrow we're doing volleyball. We're gonna all go play volleyball. And then we would get all their numbers and names. And this is kind of creepy, <laughs> but but we had a, a spreadsheet of the the dorm floor. It was like a printout of the the dorm floor. And my brother and I we went back to our room, scurried back, and wrote everyone's name. And then we would get together with a couple other Christians, and we would just labor in prayer, pray for every single person. Our goal by the end of that school year was to share the gospel with every single guy um, on that floor. And people were doing that at University of Oklahoma. Um, at one point, there was like 50, 60 people living in the dorms just to do that. Um, so I think it's key. So creating a culture of inclusion, that's a great article by um, my associate director, David Clark. Here's a myth. You keep them with what you catch them with. That's a myth. Because, and I think it's true if you're a prosperity gospel church, okay, and you're, 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 you're watering down the gospel, but what we're doing is preaching a really hardcore gospel, personal, calling them to lordship, calling them repentance, and I think this statement minimizes supernatural regeneration. Because I've, um, I've seen way too many people saved that their first contact with us was a dodgeball tournament. Okay, way too many people saved, even from the flirt to convert strategy, although I don't recommend that, okay? <laughs> you know, they, they got invited. I've seen people saved by that. God, God doesn't care, exactly. God can get anyone, okay? And, uh, and we've seen that happen. So, and again, it's, it's not shallow. This type of ministry is not shallow. It's missional. It's contextualized to the campus culture. It's fitting right in to the, um, and there's extremes. If you, can, you can take this to an extreme of being, just trying to be all hype and everything, but it's actually loving to lay down your life. I've, been to, I've come to so many social events that the last thing I, do, I wanted to do was put on that smile and go play dodgeball with a bunch of college students, <laughs> okay? <laughs> just because of I, myself and my flesh. But I, we got to be fun. We got to we'll be there for them, and we'll do whatever it takes to reach lost students. So um, God, you, the purpose of these events is not, not to feed your ego, not so you can post on Instagram. It's so that your student leaders can build relationships and set up discipleship, gospel appointments and discipleship relationships with students. So our competition is not other ministries. Our competition is the gates of hell. Okay. And so keep that in mind. Don't lose a wink of sleep over a student, a, a cool Christian. You know the cool Christian that you're like, oh, man, this would be a perfect future staff member. <laughs> or this would be a perfect student leader. I've, I've had that. I've, and crew gets them for some reason because they're better looking than me or something. You know, um, um, They're all so good looking. Have you noticed crew staff? I'm just kidding. Um, um, so most ministries... Don't lose a wink of sleep over the cool Christian freshman that got away. Go and seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus did. So, but I've noticed that often the, the ministries that attract the sharpest Christians that you actually want are the ones that are focused on reaching the lost. The ones that are actually on mission, that's where the real leaders are going to come and gravitate towards something, rolling up their sleeves and doing something. So once a, um, oh, he, yeah, this is a, a zinger. Most Christian college, most college ministries do just enough to connect already interested Christian freshmen. Is that your goal? I hope not. I hope we're here to do more than just collect Christians, be a holding tank for the fish. Jesus said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, not keepers of aquariums. <laughs> okay. Um, once a new student or at your event, Train your student leaders to set up a gospel appointment with everyone that comes. So everyone on our leadership team is doing gospel appointments. Staff are modeling it. Um, our goal is, for our staff members is about 30 gospel appointments a year. Actually, yeah, no, a semester. 30 gospel appointments a semester. So that, that's our goal. And so our staff are modeling it. They're bringing student leaders with them. 
And so let's say, let's just picture, say uh, 150 students come to one of our events, and we have 50 new students. That would be a pretty awesome event, okay? And we have, right now we have about 50 student leaders. Our 50 student leaders are equipped and able to mix and mingle, focusing on the new students. And if 50 new students come about, we'd, my phone would be blowing up. We have a four, core team Facebook page group um, where they say, hey, I, I got a gospel appointment with John tomorrow. We would have about 30 gospel appointments set up. Just not, we don't have a system or a table. Sign up for a gospel appointment. We, use, we don't use the term gospel appointment. Um, so this is the phrase, more, more info on gospel appointments, check out gospelappointments.com. Um, but um, these are our mottos. <laughs> if they're breathing, they need Jesus. <laughs> okay? <laughs> when in doubt, share the gospel. So we're just going to set, we don't, I'm not smart enough to figure out who's ready to hear the I'm not omniscient. And so I'm just going to be a seed-sowing fool. I'm just going to spread the seed of the gospel and see what God wants to do. And we found that about 90% of people that attend one of our social events say yes to a gospel appointment. And this is the, um, oh yeah, the college campus is a recruitment culture. Um, even the fraternities, even the community service organization will meet with you to make sure you're not crazy so you can go help sick puppies, okay? It's the, every, every club meets with you. It's part of the campus culture. So uh, this provides a great opportunity um, to do that. So this is, we even give them a script. We have them practice. And this is what they say after making small talk, befriending them, getting to know them, playing a, a game of spike ball or something, and say, hey, I would love to grab lunch or coffee with you. We can get to know each other, and I can share more about challenge and what it's all about and how you can get plugged in. Um, you wanna, what would be a good time for you? And so we ask that to everyone that comes to any events. And so we ended up doing about, this school year, we did about 600 gospel appointments uh, pre-COVID. Uh, COVID made it a little more difficult. <laughs> but but we, had, we saw about 80 people trust Christ during COVID uh, over Zoom and and doing discovery Bible study. So that's a whole other topic. But um, before COVID, we did about 600 one-on-one -on -one face to face gospel appointments with students. Um, and 200 of those indicated decisions. So never share alone. That's a training principle. Um, you know, I, we get, I get my cues. I want to get my cues from Jesus and the early church. Okay? <laughs> this is uh, their, the vibes that they. It, it's, it's really too bad that the early church wasn't reading the evangelism books that we have today about um, <laughs> that you can't share the gospel too soon. <laughs> you know? um, but they say day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. You don't get the impression that they're worried about stepping on toes. <laughs> okay? You don't get the impression that they're worried about offending people or being too, too, close, too much too soon. Man, it's a loving. It's, it's not pressure. I'm not, don't get me wrong. We're not trying to pressure people. It's low pressure. It's relational. It's loving. I've had so many non-Christians say, I disagree with you on what you just shared with me, and I'm minorly offended by what you said. But I really appreciate the way that you did it. And I'm going to think about this, honestly. You know, and so uh, we've seen tons of people, and I've just seen so many students that that was the first time they've ever heard the gospel. I've shared with hundreds, and so many of them, they couldn't share the gospel with you to save their soul, even Christians. Most people in, in North America, most college students in North America are know just enough of, of the gospel to be inocu inoculated to it. Lost people don't know what they don't know. They're blinded. The Bible says that they're blinded. And, and there's one thing that God has chosen to open the blind eyes. Jesus said to Paul, I'm sending you to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. And so when you sit down at the coffee shop and you work through that, that process, their story, your story, God's story, and we, we have a gospel lesson that we use, and uh, we, we transition their story, your story, and I say, yeah, one thing we do in our ministry is we help people, and it's called discipleship. And we help people grow closer to Jesus. And we actually have one lesson, the first lesson we always share with everyone. We share this with everyone that comes to our ministry, and whether you're a Christian or not. It's how you can have a relationship with God through Christ and what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Do you mind if I show that to you? And I pull it out of my backpack. 
<laughs> and my, and, and I've, I've had, out of hundreds of them that I've done, I've had one person say no at that point. And most people, and, and so even if they're a Christian, even if they have a Jesus Saves shirt on, <laughs> okay, I'm going to do that gospel appointment, and we've seen a lot of Christians come to Christ. Okay, <laughs> we've seen a lot of people turn from sin and trust Christ, because we share this illustration called the pie illustration. And we do, um, I can send you the gospel lesson if you email me, but at the end of the gospel lesson, we use Romans 6.23, Jesus Christ, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we do the one verse bridge, it is part of our lesson, and then we circle the word Lord. And I say, now let's look at what this word Lord means. And I draw a pie chart on the piece of paper, and I say, this is like, imagine your life. Do you ever, this is your girlfriend, or lack thereof, okay? <laughs> this, this is your friends, this is your free time, this is your future, this is everything in your life. And then sometimes people give God or Jesus a slice of their life. And I say, that's actually not what it means to be a Christian. When you become a follower of Christ, you invite Jesus, I draw a cross in the center of the pie, and I draw a separate pie chart, and I say, you invite Jesus to come in and rule your life. He determines what you do with your girlfriend on a Friday night. He determines your future. He calls a shot in your future, your free time, every area of your life, and it's the best thing in the world. But he, you turn from your sin and you trust Christ to be Lord of your life. Would you like to make that decision right now? Then you zip the lip. We call it the golden question, okay? <laughs> the, the most awkward three seconds of your entire life, okay? <laughs> but it's a, it's, a, it's a question and a moment that can change someone's eternity. The Holy Spirit, um, we've just seen so, God do so many things. So at, train them in how to do this. Train them in how to do gospel appointments. And uh, I love Apostle Paul. He's a good, good model for us. He said, I know you, I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly and house to house. Here's a question I want to haunt you. I want to haunt you. How many students on my campus will hear the gospel this week? I heard about missionaries and unreached people groups, um, missionary strategists that put that, a plaque on their wall, in their office wall. How many of my people in this unreached people group heard the gospel today? So what if you did some, what if you printed that out and posted that on your, on your office wall? Most of us don't have offices. You should probably office on campus in the union, but... Um, but I think a lot of us are way too smart for our own good, okay? A lot of us overthink evangelism. I think, you know, it's fine to, I'm, I'm happy to read all the books about evangelism, I love it, but I'm, convic I'm convinced that we need to do less rethinking evangelism and more doing evangelism, okay? Uh, there are some missionaries in a, in a Muslim people group that went and they, they were there for seven years and they saw no fruit, no Christians, no new believers, and the eighth year, they started to see, like, these bunch of people come to Christ, new churches started, this movement of God, and the supervisor came and said, hey, what changed? And the, the missionary looked at him with, with sadness, and he said, we started sharing the gospel. <laughs> he said, what? Excuse me? We started sharing the gospel. Um, and so I just think we, we, we need, we don't necessarily need new methods, we need new boldness. You know, Acts 4, when they were threatened with their uh, lives, they, got a, they called a prayer meeting, and they didn't pray for protection. They prayed, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak with great boldness. Every time God's people are filled with the Spirit of God, they speak God's word boldly. I was talking with Robbie Gowdy and, this morning, and he told his youth pastor was there, and they're talking about how the youth, they're training them in evangelism, and they baptized 300 youth. In the, in the past five months. And they're seeing viral movements in the high schools. And um, one high school student that just got radically saved stood up in the cafeteria and invited everyone to their youth group. <laughs> uh, stood, stood up on the table in the cafeteria to invite everyone. And they're, they're seeing persecution, people thrown into lockers. And, uh, you know, when, when God moves, Satan counterattacks. And so I want to be, I don't know, I want to be on the front lines of the battle for this next generation. And so I think God is calling us to do that. Um, so here's a great question. If someone comes to know Jesus, ask him this question. Who else do you know that needs to hear this? That is a gold mine of a question, you guys. 
Um, I had a, uh, Cody, one of our staff members, asked a guy named Noah that question that came to Christ. So Cody did, Cody did a gospel appointment. Noah came to one of our um, dodgeball tournaments or something. And Cody did a gospel appointment. Noah was just, it was rigged. Like God had been working on Noah for a long time. He came to Christ on the spot. And Cody asked Noah, who, who do you know that might want to hear this? And notice, Noah said, oh, yeah, my buddy Manny. He's my roommate. Like, and so the next day, Noah helped lead Manny to Jesus Christ. <laughs> he just sat there, and they, they did, it, did it together. And then they asked Manny, hey, who do you know that might be interested? And, and this guy named Ryan um, came, and Ryan Leong. And um, one of our other student leaders sat down with him, and Ryan said that he grew up in church, but he was sleeping around. He was involved in partying. And um, he said when they shared the gospel with him, he said it was like a sledgehammer just came and wrecked and broke my heart. And so he got radically saved, and now he's been leading our Greek ministry to, uh, to fraternities and sororities for the last few years. And now he's going to a new campus, UC Santa Cruz, to, do, to start a new, help start a new ministry. Um, so that all came from one new believer. New believers are the best people in the world to share their faith because they have the most non-Christian friends, and they don't know that it's not normal to share their faith. <laughs> they don't know any better. Okay? So let's, let's create that culture. So if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. Okay, I want to challenge you. This does me no PR favors, but I think most collegiate ministries across the nation could double what they're doing and not be in any danger of overdoing it or burnout. I think you could do twice as many days tabling and surveying and twice as many events. When the student is looking for events every day for the first two weeks, I don't think we should be doing three events. Okay? I think we should be doing more. And, and they're looking for friends. So, so I just want to challenge us. What, pray, get with your team and pray about what could you do to double. What if you doubled everything that you did? The amount of contacts you sought to God, the amount of events, everything that you did, the amount of people you shared the gospel with. Get together with your team. This is my challenge, my closing challenge. Get together with your team and set some faith goals. A faith goal is something that's so big that can only happen by divine intervention. One of my heroes in ministry is, is Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade, and he was always asking God for big things. That's one thing that I really admire about crew that's still, still to this day, is they, are, they really value taking steps of faith, taking leaps of faith. And, um, I, don't, I don't want crew just to have the corner on the market on that, okay? I want us to step up and, and see God do the impossible. And I've seen it, that when we make um, goals, big goals, there's two types of goals. There's, there's lead measures and there's lag me measures. Lead measures and lag measures. Lead measures means, like, how many contacts you get, how many events you do, the more things you can control. Lag measures is how many people get saved, how many people, disciples, and things you can't control. So I have faith goals for both, but I want to encourage you to make goals for, that, you, that are more you can control, lead measures, and then pray and trust and, and fast and pray that God does things for the lag measures. And then I would just close. Oh, yeah, this is a book I encourage you all to read. It's called Principles God Honors, and it's a crew resource. And they tell story after story of these amazing movements of God um, across the nation. Um, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. Love that quote. Okay, I'm going to skip to you. Don't apologize for asking too much of students. <laughs> apologize for not asking enough of them. And we found that students in this generation are looking for a cause. And what greater cause than reaching their own campus for Jesus? And uh, we've we found we've had to slow down students. Once they catch the vision and they, they've seen God move, nothing mobilizes like seeing life change. Not, then seeing their peers lead someone else to Christ. They say, hey, I want to do that. I want to get in on that action. And I just pray that God will bring spiritual momentum and there will be a snowball effect. You just need those first few pickles out of the jar, okay? And you've you got to get that snowball going. Um, but and the last thing, which is, should have been the first thing, actually, is mobilize masses, massive amounts of prayer for your fall outreach. And I wrote a whole article on what we do to uh, mobilize prayer. But um, recently, I've been trying to pray for an hour a day personally. 
And uh, one thing that Robbie Gallaty was saying is, before God can do a mighty move through you, he has to do a mighty move in you. And so that's actually, I, I could go on about that, but personally you got to do it, and then you got to mobilize prayer. Um, I came across this quote, uh, actually Clayton Bullion was talking to this guy, Paul Watson, that did a, a massive movement of God. He saw a massive movement of God. He wrote a book called Contagious Disciple Making, and he was talking with Clayton, and, Cl- and Clayton was like, why haven't we seen spiritual movements on our college campuses? And he said this, we have yet to see a true disciple-making movement of God on the college campuses because college ministries do not act like they're in a spiritual battle. They walk into their campuses thinking that Satan will just hand over the most strategic demographic on the planet without a fight. You need at least a thousand people praying for you in your campus before you can expect any serious movement of God on your campus. So we do a 21 days of fasting and prayer from the day leading up to the first day of school. So our ministry, we have a we PDF prayer guide. I have 70 people that I text personally for any event, anything that, that's, that's going on. Um, each of our, the, the perk of support raising is you got, if you have 50 supporters, each of them are invested and they'll pray for you. So when our team of 10 staff, support raising staff, steps on the campus, you do the math, that's, that's a lot of people praying and getting ready for that. So let's mobilize as much prayer as we can. Let's leave it all on the court. Okay, I got one more quote. You guys okay with one more? I'm going to do it anyway. Charles Spurgeon, again, he said this, Brethren, do something, do something, do something. While societies and unions make constitutions, let us win souls. I pray you to be men of action, all of you. Get to work and quit yourselves like men. Old Savaro's idea of war is mine. Forward, no strike, no theory, attack, form the column, charge the bayonets, plunge into the center of the enemy. Our aim is not, not to win, it, our aim is to win souls, and this we are not to talk about, but to do in the power of God. Let me pray. God, um, I pray again that you would just humble us, that you would help us to see that you want to do more on our campuses and in our ministries, that we would trust you with the fruit, we would honor you with our faith, that we would trust you with the fruit, Lord, that we wouldn't compare, Lord, college ministry is not a competition, Um, but God, I pray that we would honor you by leaving everything on on the floor, by giving our all to reach these students for Christ. So give us creative ideas, give us wisdom. Most of all, give us courage. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Campus Ministry Today's Summer Sessions. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to the podcast. And make sure to check out Season 1 of the CMT Podcast, where Chad and Paul interviewed seasoned campus ministers from across the country on best practices in evangelism, disciple-making, and mission mobilization. Be on the lookout for Season 2, coming this fall.